So the last that we saw was essentially we have these three regions of operation for a uh, transistor, cutoff, linear and saturation. Right? Over here ID is equal to 0, over here ID is equal to mu n C ox W by L VDS into VGS minus VT minus VDS by 2 and over here ID is equal to mu n C ox W by L VGS minus VT the whole squared by 2. Okay? So in the linear region current depends on both the VDS as well as VGS. Okay. Whereas in the saturation region it depends only on VGS that is assuming that the VDS is sufficiently high that the channel has got saturated so the current is determined only by the gate over drive right? VGS minus VT. This is sometimes called the gate over drive. Okay. So these are the three parameters and as far as we are concerned this is how a MOSFET works. This is how an ideal MOSFET works. Okay. Now already there are problems in the sense that what does this mean in terms of the transfer function of a MOSFET versus what I would actually like a switch to look like. Okay. What am I trying to do finally? I want a MOSFET to look like a switch. Okay, I want to use a MOSFET as a switch rather. Okay. And in particular, I want to use it as a voltage controlled switch. Okay, so what that means is there will be a control terminal and there will be two other terminals A and B over here. Whenever the voltage at the control is a certain value, usually when it is on then I expect A and B to be completely shorted together and when it is off I expect A and B to be completely separated from each other an open circuit okay but that is fine as far as the only possibilities that I have are on and off right so if the control is either on or it is off but in reality the control itself is a voltage which means that it is going to vary between 0 to whatever is the maximum voltage in our case it will be 1.8 volts okay so what would an ideal switch in this case look like what should the behavior of a switch look like over here right we can actually think in terms of what i'll call the id the current flowing through the switch okay as a function of control voltage What do I expect this transfer function to look like? What should it look like? Huh? So, when V control is 0, how much should the ID be? 0. Okay, so that much is fine. Right, so this point at least we know. When V control is on, right? I will call this 1.8 volts. What should the current be? So, it does not really make sense to ask what should the current be. A more relevant thing is any current that is required to flow through this should be allowed to flow. Okay. By that, the only way that that can happen is if the resistance between points A and B is 0. Right? If the resistance between two points is zero, it means that any current can flow between those two points without causing a potential drop. Okay? So effectively what I want is that at this point when it is on, right, any current should flow through it. Now ideally I do not want my V control to be anywhere in between. Right? So what I want over here is something like this, a curve which looks like this. That is when V control is equal to V on, any current should be permitted to flow through this, any amount of current should be permitted to flow through the switch. Okay. 
and ideally the moment it is not on that is it has not got that potential right the control has not got that much voltage the switch should be off no current so it should be zero okay so that's what an ideal switch would look like right in practice what do we have v control is equal to v gate right vg okay initially when vg is zero the current is zero as long as vg is small up to some vt there is no current but after that the current then essentially starts increasing okay so you can already see that the red curve over here is only an approximation to the black curve the ideal curve okay it behaves sort of like a switch in the sense that it says okay as you go above the threshold voltage i'll start conducting and allow more and more current to flow as you increase that vg the control voltage okay so this is one part of what is already non ideal about a transistor as a switch right if we look at it we can also look at the other part of it which is what should the current be as a function of the drain to source voltage right under the conditions that the transistor is on okay there again what do we have in the ideal situation as a function of vab okay and for different plots which essentially say what are the different values of v control right what we are saying is id should be equal to 0 if v control is less than beyond and id any value or well yeah probably infinity right right so we can't really plot it at all over here why is that why are we saying id equal to infinity because we have a zero resistance so any vab delta voltage should cause a very large current to flow through okay but in practice what we have is something which says id equal to 0 if vgs is less than vt otherwise for different values of vgs we are increasing values of the id okay so once again this is something where it sort of tries to behave like a switch but is only an approximation to that switch it doesn't have the perfect behavior that we expect okay so already we can see that a transistor is something that we can use like a switch but is not a perfect switch okay but what we are going to see now is this is not where it ends there are a number of other non idealities in terms of how a transistor behaves which also affect its performance as a switch as we try to use it okay so part of the goal of the entire digital design process is to say okay what are all the non idealities that we have and how do we sort of work around those how do we get something that works reasonably well as a set of gates or switch switch models in spite of having all these non idealities okay so the first set of non idealities the first type of non idealities that we are going to consider are something that are called short channel effects right which quite simply as the name suggests sir non idealities are coming to the behavior of a transistor as a result of how short the channel is okay so what's the channel it's the space between the drain and the source terminals okay going back to the diagram of the fed what 
what we have is this region is the L okay the length of the channel okay what we are saying is at 180 nanometer already we are in a situation where that length is quite small okay it is a pretty short length how short is short how you know what makes a transistor channel a short channel versus a long channel all of those are relative terms there is no absolute number which says this is a short channel that is a long channel so in some sense it's a continuous gradation right but there is some degree of difference between what happens at let's say 0.35 micron or 0.5 micron versus what you see at 0.18 and smaller technologies okay so already at 0.18 the short channel effects are fairly significant okay the one of the most important short channel effects is something called velocity saturation okay So what happens in velocity saturation? The first thing over here is we started off with this assumption that the electrons which are present in the channel region, right? How fast will they move across the channel? So we sort of estimated that transit time as L divided by the velocity of the electrons, and said, okay, this is the average charge present in that area. That divided by the transit time should give us the current, okay, the rate of flow of charge. Okay, so that's how we derive the ID value to start with. Okay. That velocity in turn we said is going to be given by mu n times E where E is the lateral electric field. By lateral electric field I mean sideways from brain to source, okay, pointing from brain to source. Why is this particularly important? Because you are also applying a VG which means that there is some amount of electric field also going towards the bulk. Okay, the net electric field at any given point is a combination of the field due to the VVS potential and the VG to bulk potential as well. Okay, but we are primarily interested in the lateral electric field and that is what we take in order to estimate the velocity of the electrons. Okay, mu n into E. Okay. Now, it turns out that this is a fairly good approximation, right? This is an empirical model. There is no physical reason why the velocity should be proportional to the electric field. Normally, the acceleration would have been proportional to the electric field, right? Because the force on the electron is going to be proportional to the electric field and then divided by the mass, the acceleration should have been proportional to the electric field. But what happens is because the electron sort of starts to accelerate, then bumps into some particles, slows down and so on. On average, we find that the velocity itself can be taken as proportional to this electric field. Okay. So, this is already an empirical equation, mu n into E. It turns out that the equation starts to have more problems as the value of the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field becomes larger. Okay. So, as the magnitude of the electric field becomes large, it, what we find is that if we were to plot V versus E, right, and explicitly drawing magnitude of E over here, but I'm anyway whenever I use E, I primarily mean only the magnitude of the field. Okay? What we expect is that it should just go be a linear plot, right? With the slope equal to the mobility. But what happens in practice is after a certain point this starts tapering off. Okay? And in particular, what happens is that after a while, the velocity just saturates at a certain point, right? There is no further increase in the velocity even if you increase the electric field, okay? Now, it is possible to define something called EC, right? which is pretty much this point where the saturation occurs. Now, it is not a single point, it is not that you know exactly it goes linear up to a certain point and then flattens out, but for convenience it makes sense to talk about something called EC, a critical field. At which the saturation, velocity saturation occurs.
okay then what we can say is that the v saturation is equal to mu n times e c okay yeah now e c itself right as a first order approximation we can take it as what is the field across the lateral field going to be it's going to be the potential gradient of the potential right across the drain to source so as a first order approximation what we can say is that gradient can be approximated as the actual delta voltage divided by the distance okay right but this vd is by l at the point of saturation okay now ec is a constant it essentially depends on the material that you are using as well as the properties of the electrons and so on okay so once again it's not something in the vlsi designers control or at least not the circuit designers control okay so once you know that ec is a constant it makes sense for us to take ec into l and call it vd sat okay this vd sat now becomes a new parameter that we can use okay so how do we make use of this effectively what we are going to say is this vd sat is going to be some number right just like we have a threshold voltage the vd sat is also some other number right the important thing to keep in mind is the moment that the vds across the trans across the drain to source terminals becomes greater than vd sat the field in that channel region is at least equal to this ec therefore electrons are going to be velocity saturated okay what does that mean it means that now the current that is going to flow through is going to be determined by just that saturation velocity okay and one way of writing it is essentially to say is effectively what we are saying that the current is going to be proportional to the velocity of the uh, the charge multiplied by uh, the whatever the charge per unit length multiplied by the average velocity of the electrons okay so c ox w into vgs minus vt is the charge per unit length is one way of looking at it multiplied by the amount of length covered per unit time v sat is essentially going to give us the current okay or another way of writing this is to say that v sat itself is equal to mu n into vd sat by l okay which means that ids basically becomes equal to mu n c ox w by l into vgs minus vt into vd sat okay so you can compare this with the linear equation over here right mu n c ox w by l into vds replace vds by vd sat we have vgs minus vt minus this vds by 2 this term we are sort of not got in our final derivation okay but it is at least closely related to that linear equation right it's still saying okay there's a relationship between vgs and vds but now the vds has exceeded vd sat from this point onwards the current is only given by this constant and is no longer influenced by vds okay previously what would have happened until vds equal to vgs minus vt the current would have kept increasing and then would have saturated 
Now we are saying once VDS becomes equal to VD sat, the current stops increasing and saturates. Okay. Usually, depending on the value of VD sat, chances are that this velocity saturation is going to happen earlier than the pinch off. What does that mean? It means that the maximum current that you are going to get to is going to be lower than what you would have got if you went all the way up to pinch off. Okay. So, velocity saturation has the effect that the current saturates earlier. Okay. Meaning that you do not get as much current out of the transistor as you would have expected based on the equations that we derived to start with. Okay. What we will end up with is where you expect to see something like this, you will end up getting something which looks instead like saturating at a much lower current. Okay. What are the values at which it saturates? Finally, it saturates when VDS becomes equal to VD sat. Right? So, finally, the saturation potential also depends on that. Okay. But at the same time, if VDS is very small or if VGS minus VT is very small, you might find that the transistor actually saturates when it hits VGS minus VT and actually pinches off rather than going all the way up to VD sat and getting velocity saturated. Right? So, what is this situation? What we are talking about is VGS minus VT is small. So, before VDS can reach all the way up to that critical field, it pinches off and saturates as a result of that. Okay. So, it becomes a little difficult to sort of keep track of all these different options. When is it going to go into velocity saturation? When is it going to go into saturation? When is it in the linear region? So, what we do for convenience at least for any calculations that we need to do by hand is to try and unify all of these equations into a simpler model that we can use. Okay? And the model that we use over there is to say IDS is equal to 0 if VGS is less than VT. This remains the same. Okay? But for VGS greater than VT I am going to give another equation which basically says IDS is equal to mu n C ox W by L times V min into VGS minus VT minus V min by 2, right? Where V min is equal to the minimum among VGS minus VT, VDS and VD sat. Okay. How did we come up with this equation? It is purely empirical. We looked at the equation that we started with. Right? Forget VD sat completely for the time being. Right? And now look at what we have over there. Effectively, this equation in a simple way captures both the linear and cutoff regions and pinch off based cutoff regions if you just leave VD sat completely out of the picture. Right? What it says is, for small values of VDS, VDS will be the smaller among these two quantities, VGS minus VT and VDS. Therefore, the equation that you get when you put V min is equal to VDS will be mu and Cx W by L into VDS times VGS minus VT minus VDS by 2. Okay? Linear region equation. But what if VDS is greater than VGS minus VT? Then VGS minus VT is the minimum. Put that in there. What does your equation become? Mu and C ox W by L into VGS minus VT into VGS minus VT minus VGS minus VT by 2. Simplify all of that, you get mu and C ox W by L into VGS minus VT the whole square by 2. Saturation. Okay. We have added one more condition, VD sat. If VD sat is the smallest among these three quantities, it means that your VDS and VGS minus VT were such that velocity saturation actually occurs in the channel before it pinches off. So, plug that in, VD sat. 
and the equation you get is mu n c ox w by l into v d sat times v g s minus v t minus v d sat by 2. That minus v d sat by 2 was not there in the equation we had earlier, but we keep it there for convenience. It is not a big error. It sort of gives us numbers that are fairly close and it also gives us continuity in the equation as a result of doing that. Okay. But the thing to keep in mind is you can already see that we have already sort of fudged the equation a little bit to sort of see how to get it continuous over there. This is not an accurate equation. There are approximations being made over here. Okay. It works in practice reasonably well, therefore it is used. Right. So that is pretty much all that we should consider as far as this is concerned. Okay. All right, so this is the equation, the sort of combined level one equation. There are still some extensions to this that need to be considered. Okay, we'll look at those in more detail on Monday.